Hi, I'm Dale Matchek. I'm the chairman of the economics department at Northwood University. Welcome to Northwood University's Freedom Seminar. This is an event where we invite people from around the country, experts in their own field, to share their ideas about how the Northwood idea applies to issues of the day. And this year we are talking about COVID-19, obviously. It, it has huge political, economic, and ethical uh, issues that we need to discuss. And this is the final presentation of the series. You can go to our website to see some of the presentations that you may have missed earlier. Uh, we've been learning a lot this weekend about uh, COVID-19. And uh, I've invited for the last session, uh, a journalist who herself is uh, a believer in the, in the philosophy of individual liberty, responsibility, has uh, contributed for many years uh, to reporting on issues of the day and is the perfect person to talk to us today about uh, how COVID-19 is affecting not only the country, but our state. Um, her name is Tika Damia. She is a uh, reporter, um, a journalist, for, uh, columnist for Reason Magazine. Um, she lives here in Michigan, but uh, she writes a column for Bloomberg Magazine and uh, she has um, been contributing for many years stories about individual freedom, responsibility, and she's here to talk about how those ideas relate now to uh, current events. So I'm going to be asking uh, you a series of questions. Shika, uh, welcome to Northwood University. Thanks for having me on, Dale, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to get out of my pajamas and into a clean black. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I know you live in Michigan, and uh, our campus is in Michigan here, our main campus, and uh, many of the students who are here uh, listening to you today are from Michigan. And so one of the first questions I would like to ask you is, um, why is it that Michigan uh, seems to have been hit so hard? It seems like coronavirus has had a disproportionate uh, effect on our state. Um, can you provide us with any insight into why that might be the case? Uh, yeah, that's a, you know, it's a good question. Um, in Michigan, I think for a while, was has been in the top five states that have been worst hit. And uh, which actually doesn't even tell you the full story because, you know, you've got to compare apples to apples. Uh, you know, if it's worse hit than Montana, well, yeah, of course. Uh, Montana is very sparsely populated, but it's actually been worse hit than most of the great, than all of the Great Lakes state. So I was like, did some rough comparisons in preparation, uh, you know, for this talk. And um, if you look at Illinois, Illinois and Michigan actually have roughly the same population. We have 10 million people, they have 13 million people. I mean, so there have been like, you know, two leading theories about why Michigan has been wor worst hit. And I don't think either one of those really works. The first is that there's something special about our demographics, right? That, you know, uh, we are um, um, a poorer population, more minority population than Illinois. And uh, as it turns out, um, the, you know, the worst hit places in Michigan have been Detroit. Oakland County and Kent County. Detroit is minority and poor. Oakland County is wealthy and diverse. And Kent County, which is where Grand Rapids is wealthy and not diverse. So, you know, so the sort of the demographic theory doesn't hold that much water. Um, the interesting thing is in Illinois, um, the number of people who got coronavirus are the same as in Michigan. Michigan's death rate is twice, is the same as Illinois, or, or the number of deaths are the same as in Illinois, which means that the death rate is twice as high in Michigan. So that's mm -hmm. like an interesting, yeah, fact that we need to, you know, kind of explore. Now, before we get to that, yeah, the second theory is that Detroit uh, is, has got an international hub uh, in terms of a major uh, airport. Uh, but, you know, if you look at Chicago, that's a very diverse city too, and it's got lots of international connections. And if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the ethnic population of uh, Chicago, the number of Chinese Americans there are the same as over here. So that, that was the other theory part of the international connectedness that 
you know, uh, Detroit has a lot of uh, supply chains that are based in Wuhan. It's got a lot of Chinese citizens. And that turns out that, you know, Illinois has just as many. So that doesn't explain it either. So uh, the only thing that makes sense to me actually in this case is the official response and the speed, you know, and the speed of the initial response. Now we've all heard that, you know, Corona spreads exponentially. Uh, but what's less well known is now there are demographic conditions that determine what they call the RT rate, the spread rate, whether, you know, one person gives it to two more people or four more people, things like population density, you know, maybe even the weather affects that. Uh, but uh, the baseline health of the population may affect that. But the, the part that's not so well understood is that even the fatality rate is nonlinear. So which means that, um, you know, if 10 people get the disease and one, you know, and one person dies, that's a 10 person fatality rate. If 100 people get the disease, the death rate is not necessarily 10 percent. It could be 20 percent, 30 percent. And that's because if your healthcare facilities get overwhelmed and they can't deal with the caseload, then the death rate goes up mm -hmm. and the morbidity rate goes up too. Uh, and so it really mattered whether, you know, if one, it, it, uh, states that were even three days behind in implementing the you know, social distancing measures got far worse hit than those that did not. So the Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, all of them went into lockdown about three to four days before Michigan. And I think that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same thing is with New York and uh, San Francisco. Uh, they were both hit at exactly the same time. San Francisco went into you know, emergency mode much faster than New York did. New York is like a casebook study of every official at every level you know, botching the response. I mean, Andrew Cuomo is getting very high marks now, but uh, for the longest time, he was actually denying that there was any problem. Uh, you know, Donald, President Trump gets the rap for that and he deserves to get the rap for that. But so was Bill Blas Blasio, so was Andrew Cuomo. And so uh, New York was way behind in responding. So I think in Michigan's case, like we lost about a week, and I think that made a big difference in overwhelming local local facilities, uh, you know, ca catching them flat footed. So I think that made a, made a big difference. Yeah, I know some people have suggested that letting the states make their own policies uh, might have uh, been, well, some people criticized President Trump for not making it a national policy and letting the states decide uh, would you agree with that? Um, not really, because, you know, if the national government gets everything right and, uh, you know, and Im implements that perhaps, but, you know, in this case, if you look at the national government, it botched the response at every level, right? I mean, President Trump was denying that there was a problem for the longest time. I mean, he was assuring us that this was just going to disappear. It's going to be a miracle. But he wasn't the only, you know, even when his own advisors like Peter Navarro were telling him, no, that this is something serious. And there are memos uh, showing that, you know, was happening in like late January, and I don't agree with Peter Navarro on anything, right? I mean, he's on trade, he's actually not very good from our point of view. But in this, he was actually trying to warn the authorities and warn President Trump that this was something serious, and uh, President Trump was denying it. But that wasn't the only thing. CDC couldn't get its, uh, its testing right. There were researchers in uh, Washington state which caught the disease very early on. I mean, they were in January, they were doing a flu study and incidentally realized that there was something new going on and they actually caught some cases of coronavirus, you know, there. And uh, at that point, and they caught it among people who had not traveled to China. So they knew there was something spreading, uh, you know, in the local population. And they were begging, begging uh, President, uh, I'm sorry, the CDC to let them go, you know, implement their own tests of these flu swabs that they had already gathered. And the CDC would not give them permission because those tests had not been approved by the CDC. 
CDC sent them new tests, which did not work. And so, uh, uh, so those tests did not work. And so and the, and the, these researchers were, you know, literally going through every bureaucratic hoop to try and speed up the approval and could not get it. Then we lost like a whole month. Now, if CDC had been in charge at that time of every state and sending these faulty tests for a whole month longer, I think we would have been far worse off. So, yeah, you know, it all sounds very good. Let these central planners and these technocrats take over. And if you really know what's going on and have all kinds of very granular knowledge, that's good. But Corona was you know, a disease where there was so much uncertainty I and mean, there's still so much uncertainty. We are all discombobulated. I mean, the world has completely changed. And to think that the central planners could get it right in a jiffy, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's it's overly simplistic. It's hubristic. Yeah. So um, we've been talking about differences uh, geographically between the states, but I think there's also some Important differences even within the state. For example, Michigan, you mentioned there are certain areas which have been hard hit and other areas hardly at all. Right. Um, do, you, do you think it's uh, just to apply kind of the same reasoning, does that apply at the state level as well that uh, maybe it should be a more flexible or decentralized response in terms of how a particular geographical area within the state is affected by the public policies or, or should it be a one size fits all approach? No, it's a, you know, it's a very good question. I mean, you know, the the reason, the rationale for, uh, you, uh, you know, a sort of a broader response rather than a very, very localized response is that there's an externality issue right over here mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, uh, one person has this disease and travels to another place and I we are going to get into the whole travel question and they can spread that disease right so I may live in West Bloomfield Michigan but if I go to and I'm in I've just come suppose if I've just come back from Wuhan and I'm infected and I go to uh, Marquette and start traveling over there I could potentially pass that disease on you know to Marquette so um you know, so Marquette gets one vector and it doesn't socially distance and, you know, the whole community could get affected. I mean, there is that, you know, rationale. You know, I think what we do have to separate is, the in, you know, what needed to be done initially from what needed, you know, what needs to be done now. I mean, I buy this, you know, this, uh, I, I bought the initial argument for the lockdown and I think, almost everybody or a lot of people did that initially precisely because we didn't know what we were dealing with what what this monster was and there was this fear that you know this does spread very exponentially which is more or less you know um i think till we caught our breath it was the lockdown was fine we also knew uh, that hospitals were not prepared, that uh, they did not have enough protective equipment. They had not had time to right. prepare because they came on, this came on very and, suddenly. And, and Italy, which was hit a little earlier, had provided us with some terrible images about what happens exactly. when they're overwhelmed. Right. Italy, you know, terrible images coming out of Italy, Italy with, you know, um, bodies piling up. Spain was the same story. Um, you know, so, so there was this, and there is, I mean, like, you know, there is no country, there's no polity where bodies are piling up and the government just does nothing and people just accept. I mean, it's just not going to happen, right? I mean, like, so I, I get, I got the initial argument for the lockdown, uh, and flattening the curve, this term, which is now, you know, everybody knows. I think infants are going to bo be born knowing flattening the curve. It's become, <laughs> much part of our lexicon now. Uh, so the argument over there that we need to lock down so that uh, we stop the, you know, it's a circuit breaker. We stop the spread of the disease in, and we get to catch our breath, get uh, hospitals, get time to prepare. And then, you know, we start easing things. There was this, so the, the logic of the lockdown was never that we were actually going to uh, reduce the actual number of deaths, right? The argument for the rationale was 
um, that we are going to, uh, you know, give our hospitals uh, the time to prepare so that any unnecessary avoidable deaths, people who, you know, don't have to die from corona won't die because they will get the medical treatment. Um, so that was a, not a bad argument. And uh, at that point, I think it was all right to have a statewide lockdown. I think as time goes on and we realize that the remoter regions are not hit and they are not going to be hit because they naturally pra practice social distancing, right? I mean, if your next neighbor is a mile away and you see them literally, you know, once a week because that's <laughs> natural lifestyle, right? Then you don't need to be under lockdown. So I think at this point, Michigan needs to give, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the state, a whole lot of flexibility to design its own policies. So I think with every passing day, the rationale for the kind of uh, the lockdown that we saw initially uh, becomes less and less. And I think it is a huge problem that Michigan is still under a lockdown uh, and not easing as much as it should. Hmm. Well, um, something could be said similar with respect to giving people flexibility based or maybe this is, maybe I'm wrong about this, but um, some people have suggested that we shouldn't quarantine healthy people, um, that quarantine should be limited to those that have tested positive or at high risk. Um, I, I don't know whether that kind of flexibility would be a good idea. What, what are your thoughts about that? So, uh, you know, basically that's the Swedish model, right? I mean, uh, or a variation or, uh, I suppose, a more extreme version of the Swedish model. I mean, what Sweden has done is essentially uh, there's no lockdown. Uh, they have uh, banned large gatherings and, uh, you know, and they have imposed some controls on restaurants and, you know, bars where people are crammed in. Um, other than that, uh, you know, they have basically erred on the side of letting people make their own decisions, but giving them a whole lot of information about, you know, hygienic practices, social distancing. And, you know, so that's kind of like the argument, uh, you know, that's that, that's a kind of flexibility. And, you know, a lot of people who are high risk in Sweden or are, uh, you know, infected, they are just voluntarily socially distancing themselves, quarantining themselves. Um, now, you know, if you look at the Swedish data, it's interesting because, it, 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 you know, if you look at the international spectrum, you have countries like Italy and Spain, which had a very fast spread and a very high mortality rate, like almost 20% mortality rate, right? And then you have countries like Taiwan and South Korea where that didn't have a lockdown and it didn't spread because they followed actually something, you know, called TTQ, uh, um, uh, testing, tracing and quarantining very early on. And between them is everybody else. And Sweden, which hasn't followed, hasn't done TTQing and hasn't had a lockdown is somewhere in the middle of both those strategies. So, you know, if we are going to be in the middle, no matter what we do, that's an argument against a lockdown. On the other hand, if you compare, or do a more apples to apples comparison and compare Sweden with other, you know, uh, countries, um, you know, its neighbors, Norway and Denmark, its fatality rate begins to look really quite bad. It's, you know, it's got a much higher fatality rate than Denmark and Norway. Uh, now, Sweden's argument is that it's front loading its death rate, that, you know, it's basically letting the disease run its course and letting people develop immunity as they go along so that it reaches to the point of herd immunity. You know, more people are exposed and then they develop resistance. And once they develop resistance, you know, we the disease stops, stops spreading. So Sweden is trying to get to herd immunity. But what that means is it's front loading its death rate. So there are far more fatalities arguably happening in Sweden than need to happen because it's not locked, it's not, it, not locking down and the disease is spreading. 
Uh, but Sweden's argument is that later on, once we have herd immunity, then there'll be fewer deaths. So they'll come out, you know, ahead in, in their view. It's a risky, in my view, I mean, I'm glad it's a risky argument, but I'm glad they are trying it. We'll yeah. have some, you know, you know we, we need some variation in our responses so that we can test various hypotheses and various hunches. So Sweden is trying it. I mean, I would not, rec I would not have recommended that strategy for the United States um, because, you know, the baseline health of the population is not as great as it is in Sweden. Uh, one of the comorbidities that's a fa uh, that is correlated with a high death rate is obesity. And, you know, the U.S. has quite a few obese people. And uh, Johan Norberg, who is a, Friedish, uh, a Swedish uh, libertarian who's written quite a bit for reason on this, points out that the Swedish population has a tendency to actually listen to the experts. Right. I mean, and so when they are told that this is a serious disease, you get a whole you get a lot of voluntary compliance. Um, that's not the case in America, not generally and certainly not right now when there is actually so much distrust of, you know, any information that any expert gives. So I'm not sure the Swedish model would really work over here, but I'm glad Sweden is trying it. The other danger with the Swedish model is that it's risking everything. It's wagering everything on this idea of herd immunity, which assumes that once you are exposed to this disease, you are not going to get it again or you're not going to get it for a very long time. We don't know that right now. You know, right now, it's not clear that, you know, we'll ever get to the point of herd immunity. So, um, you know, so it's an open question whether the Swedish model is a good one or not. But if we don't get to that point it's ever, then it's just a question of waiting for the virus. Could we wait long enough for a virus? I'm sorry, uh, uh, some kind of Im um, immunization. Yeah. Can we wait? I yeah, mean no, it's a good, so, the, you know, that was the other argument for flattening the curve was, right, that we get time to prepare, our hospitals get time to prepare their, you know, get more ventilators, get, you know, PPE for protective equipment for their healthcare workers. And the other was, well, we are buying time for a treatment or a vaccine. Now, if a treatment or a vaccine emerges, then I think Sweden will look very foolish, right? Because they have, they front loaded the deaths. So they've had a whole lot of deaths and there could have been a vaccine and these people or a treatment and these people could have been saved, right? Um, but if we don't get a vaccine, or we and we don't get a treatment, then I think the Swedish approach will look really good. So, you know, part of this is in this situation of imperfect knowledge and uh, a very, very tentative understanding of this disease. Uh, you know, what what uh, kind of trade offs are we willing to make? I mean, and this is a situation where there, there is really, you know, no but anybody who says that we know exactly what needs to be done and we can tell you, you know, with certainty one approach is better than the other is just lying to you. I mean, you re we really don't know. So there are these different approaches being, try ty uh, being tried and time will really tell which will work out. But isn't it attractive to many libertarians um, that people are taking uh, risks voluntarily? You could stay home, you could socially isolate, or if you want to get together with friends at the coffee shop, you can do that. And in fact, this um, this is one of the big issues surrounding uh, our, our policy response. To what extent do we rely on individuals making their own decisions as to what the acceptable level of risk is for them? And I, I just, many people would argue from a libertarian perspective uh, that we're infringing on, on individual liberty. So. What's what's your response to that? So, you know, um, I mean, even uh, every libertarian theorist, whether it is, you know, Robert Nozick or, uh, you know, Frederick Hayek or anybody, you know, will tell you that if there is any legitimate role for the government, it is to protect individual, individuals from each other when they become a threat to each other, right? So if you were carrying... You know, if you were carrying a weapon and you came to my house to kill me and I called the police and they prevented you from killing me, 
or if I were to, uh, you know, assume arms and self-defense, it's, you know, that's sort of one legitimate role of the government is to protect individual life and health from not only external threats, but also internal ones. So, so I, I mean, so I think there is a role for government. Now, the but the government needs to do it with the minimal necessary force, not the maximal possible, right? Which is, I think, the approach that somebody like Gretchen Whitmer has taken, that she wants to, you know, be, you know, impose the maximal lockdown because, you know, oh, precautionary principle that, uh, you know, we just always, we can't take any risk whatsoever. Yeah, the precautionary uh, principle, that's the idea that um, if there's something that we can't undo, you know, the risk that, that could be perhaps very bad and we can't go back, uh, we should just avoid it at all costs. Right, exactly. Like so, you know, global warming, because global warming is irreversible, uh, any, um, a, you know, every, any cost to avert it is worth it. So, uh, so, you know, so whatever price is necessary to avert global warming, we need to do it because we just need to be safe rather than sorry, because once it sets in, we are, you know, it's going to be irreversible. So, you know, but that's an argument. I mean, if so, uh, uh, Whitmer's argument here is that, uh, you know, any anything more than essential activity, right? Any anything beyond just basic sustenance, basic activity, it means that we are going to expose our frontline workers to a greater risk of corona. And so. If I am, you know, if I go and a uh, boat in uh, my uh, motorboat because of the little fuel that will use, it'll use, and I will have to go to the fuel pump maybe two more times more than I would have had to. Well, that activity is spreading the disease to our frontline workers. I mean, that's kind of like the train of thought here. That's the logic. But if by that logic, you can just stop any activity at any time, right? Because there is always some risk associated with whatever we do as humans. There's always something we are endangering or someone we are endangering, uh, you know, by anything we do. So that's not a good argument. But so, so what really she needs to and what policymakers need to think about is, you know, the this is not an essential, inessential argument. This is Everything that can be safely done ought to be allowed. And the, only the, the most unsafe activities ought to be, you know, there may be a role for the government, you know, government in that. That, unfortunately, is not where we are here in Michigan. I think the rest of the country is moving in that direction. Um, also, one, you know, again, the argument for the lockdown was when even individuals didn't know uh, what actions they were undertaking would hurt who, you know, who. I think we have a far greater understanding of that now. And I think individuals do understand um, that, uh, you know, not wearing, I think most people understand that not wearing a mask when you go to the grocery store where you are going to be, you know, close to somebody is not just, not only are you exposing yourself to the risk, but you're also exposing them to the risk. And so it just makes sense to wear a mask. There is, I think, in this case, maybe in some other, uh, you know, illnesses, we couldn't count on this. But in this case, we really can leave things to individuals because whatever protects an individual also protects the public and their neighbors and everybody else. Right. If I wear a mask, I protect myself and I protect everybody else. So there is a great deal of. Uh, you know, sim symbiotic relationship over here. Uh, what helps me also helps my neighbors. So I think in this case, I think at this point in time, it does make sense to let people, uh, you know, decide how much risk they want to take and, uh, you know, not curb their activities, uh, you know, except on the margins in the most extreme cases. So what about the um, case where, as, as you mentioned, some countries have tried a um, test and then trace uh, approach, which would involve perhaps some conflicts with individual privacy. Um, people are concerned about what this could lead to. Uh, 
is government justified in um, you know using a smart technology to figure out where you've been and and where your movements are and who you've contacted is is that uh, an acceptable role for government in circumstances like this so it's a very good question right i mean so if you look at uh, i mean if we don't get a vaccine uh, there is an externality issue over here that you know I may be a carrier and therefore become a vector and infect a whole lot of people, many of whom will die. I mean, so there is a massive externality uh, issue over here. Um, so unless until the time that there is a vaccine, uh, there is going to be an externality issue. But every plan, uh, it, 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 any plan that you look at right now as to what to do till you have like either vaccine or herd immunity theoretically is, has massive implications for uh, civil libertarians uh, of any kind. So uh, I think, so, the, so there are basically three strategies that have been proposed right now, uh, three main strategies. One strategy is by this Nobel laureate, Paul Romer, who wants, when mass testing becomes available, he wants, you know, mass testing. So you conduct something like 22 million tests a week. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and if these, tests, if these tests are home tests, um, I think that would be great if people could just do it at home. They would know, uh, you know, uh, that you have Corona. I think if they, if these are kind of like, you know, very quick home based tests that give you a result very quickly, I think that will pose fewer civil liberties questions, right? Because I think employers, private companies, private actions, they will have a great deal of incentive to maintain corona free environments, right? And so, you know, I think you will see uh, under those circumstances that uh, companies like Ford, which have, you know, a, a factory to run, they have assembly lines, they don't want their entire workforce getting sick. So they could be implementing some tests for their workers, like, you know, you come in in the morning and you pee in a cup or whatever, or, you know, you give a little bit of your uh, sputum and they test you. If you are fine, then they, you are allowed. And you can get, a, you know, a lot of like private uh, activity going on. The problem becomes when these are not such easy tests, when you have, um, uh, you know, you need what they need right now, which is a nasal test where you have to use a swab and then you have to send it to the lab. Uh, and it takes several days for the results to come in. To come now, in. I have heard that that test can be painful, and I uh -huh. wonder if people would inflict that pain at home on themselves. Right. Exactly. And it takes many days for the results to come, right? And how are you going to tell people to do these tests? This, you know, 22 million tests a week. How are you going to convince people to? And so it's not like you get tested once. You have to get tested every 14 days. How are you going to convince people without coercion to do this test, right? So there are, you know, are, are you going to give them incentives? Is the government going to pay them or is it going to fine them? Uh, you know, so there are massive civil libertarian concerns there. The other, uh, the other approach is um, uh, the surveillance approach, which is geo-tracking. That you make, you know, that uh, you trace people's movements, um, uh, 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 you know, and uh, or no, let me uh, let me back up. So everybody has to download an app which uh, traces their movements, and when anybody tests positive, uh, you know, people whom they have come in contact with, as can be shown by this app and where they have traveled, are informed. So you have sort of, you know, there you have sort of this mass surveillance possibility. Who is going to keep this information? Who is going to keep records of this? Under what scenario are going to are you going to keep these records, right? So there are massive surveillance issues over there. Now the third approach is uh, by actually uh, Scott Gottlieb and AEI, American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank, and they are doing. They want something of a blended approach, which is Sentry surveillance, which is, you know, you go to communities and you do kind of like certain representative samples. So, you know, in a hospital, you do when they take blood, you just check, check that you know, th those blood samples for Corona. 
And if there are any clusters emerging in any population, uh, then you start doing what Korea did, South Korea did, which is testing, um, uh, tr uh, tracking and quarantining. Um, now, but how do you track people uh, when if you don't have geo tracking, if you don't have these apps, then you need human traces, right? You need that's what Korea did. They hired a lot of human traces to go and physically identify the people mm -hmm. that any Corona positive person had come in contact with. But what powers do these tracers have? Do they have police powers to uh, quarantine people? Do they have uh, powers to release private data? I mean, so th th there are all kinds of like civil libertarian issues that are, you know, I mean, we are going to have to grapple with as we go forward. And it's 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 actually, you know, it's really frightening. It's quite are, are your co uh, authors at Reason Magazine. Do they have debates among themselves on these issues? Yeah, we do all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we do. We, uh, you know, because again, uh, there are no, you know, there are no right answers over here, right? It's just a question of how much, uh, uh, you know, what do you want to emphasize as, at what time? But I mean, we, we do argue about it, but I think, I mean, we are all hugely concerned about the civil libertarian implications of this. Yes, that's been and, uh, and the history. We've done a lot. I mean, we cover this a lot, uh, you know, the civil libertarian implications of this. You know, we we are really I mean, we are covering them very closely, as are a number of other, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil liberty, you know, left wing organizations. Uh, there's mm -hmm. the Brennan, there's the Brennan Center, which is doing excellent work on this. Uh, it's sort of center left. Uh, they are doing great work on this and really keeping on top of this. And um, so, yeah, so we we are very concerned about it. now as as. Uh... One of the things that's gained a lot of attention for Michigan, uh, not always in a positive way, is the, the protests that have been happening in our state. And uh, sometimes those protesters have been characterized as uh, right-wing Michigan militia, you know, uh, crazies. Um, and sometimes as people with legitimate grievances. Um, why? I don't know. I don't have a feel for whether or not other states have had the same level of civil protest that we've seen here in, in Michigan. Uh, but uh, what's fueling these protests and uh, what do we know about the people um, that, are, that are showing up in Lansing to complain about the policies? So, you know, um, I mean, Whitmer, if you look at her popularity, right, she gets very high marks even now. Her popularity approval rating right now is at 70 plus percent. So, uh, you know, and I think the reason is that, uh, I mean, first there's the crisis, you know, you mobilize behind whoever is in charge in a crisis because you just, you know, want to help them and support them. Although interestingly, President Trump hasn't seen that kind of a bump. I mean, Whitmer wasn't so popular before Corona. I mean, she she's got high approval rating and partly it is, uh, you know, um, it's partly because uh, she has been and I have my, uh, you know, I have lots of friends who work in the healthcare sector, right? I mean, Indian friends and Indian people all over the healthcare sector and um, lots of doctors, lots of uh, physical therapists, lots of uh, frontline people, uh, you know, who I know. And they're all impressed by how quickly she actually did mobilize protective equipment. And she was kind of like on top of that. You know, they, uh, she gave support to hospitals to create uh, facilities that were just dedicated to Corona. I mean, here where I live, Beaumont had a Corona only, you know, dedicated Corona only hospital. So she did manage to mobilize resources and give, you know, a, 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 a deliver targeted relief where it was needed um, in the Metro Detroit area. So she gets very high marks from the general public. There is, um, so there are about 28% of the, you know, of Mich Michigan residents who are not happy with, with her. And I think, and I think that's because her, the two things, one, her response has been both heavy handed, heavy handed and ham handed. And 
and two, she didn't. And the reason it is that is because uh, she decided she was not going to sort of be conciliatory toward the other side, Republicans, because she was in sort of this defensive crowd. She was acting out of like fear and from the precautionary principle that any risk is too much risk. So very sensible suggestions that Republicans were giving her to moderate her lockdown. She was, you know, uninterested in those. If and she, right now she's facing 16 lawsuits. And every time she faces the lawsuit, so you know, one of the things that she did in this in when she extended the lockdown, which is when her popular, you know, the protest started the second time when she extended the lockdown, Republicans did not support that. The Republican legislature did not support that. It had supported her original lockdown. They had given her 41 days to mobilize the resources that she wanted. It was after that when she wanted to extend the lockdown beyond the 41 days, Republicans said, wait a minute. And uh, she just sort of uh, engaged in all kinds of parliamentary shenanigans to you know, get her way anyways. If she had listened to the Republicans, they were making some very sensible suggestions, one of which was, you know, don't make the essential and essential business distinction, make the safe and unsafe business distinction, allow economic activity to resume because a lot of people are hurting. I mean, this is going to be nationwide, you know, 27 million people have already lost their jobs. This is going to be worse than the Great Depression by some estimates. And Michigan is going to be, is, is being really hard hit. That said, you know, so once she lost the Republican support and didn't care to, in fact, even, you know, gain it, I do think a lot of people who just hate liberals because they just they are liberals started coming out of the woodworks and uh, mobilizing themselves around this issue. And uh, so, you know, I mean, if you there is just no question, if you go to some of these Facebook groups, they are ugly places. You know, there are there are rampant calls to behead and uh, lynch Whitmer. Last week, there was a protest here in Lansing where somebody on a flagpole had a doll with a noose around it. I mean, there have been Confederate flags. There have been swastikas, and there is no denying that. So I think the real people who are hurting are actually not coming up to these protests anymore, and they have been completely co-opted by, you know, folks who... Uh, just want to, you know, as she says, if they've become a, you know, venue to vent their racism and their sexism and their liberal hatred. So, yeah. it is, you know, so I mean, so it is just unfortunate that there is a genuine issue with what she's doing, but it's being expressed in a very irresponsible and nasty way. Mm -hmm. um. Chika, I know for many years, and a particular interest of yours has been the issue of immigration. And I know that COVID is perhaps affecting um, our immigration policy. Maybe it, the timing of it has, has already, um, the, there's been an increasing sentiment against uh, open immigration uh, in recent years. And has this accelerated that? Um, tell us a little bit about that. So, you know, my views on immigration, and I think, I mean, I've spoken at Northwood, uh, you know, on immigration before, at least some of the, I've addressed some of the classes on immigration. And, you know, for me, immigration is about freedom of movement. And I think freedom of movement is a very important right. Um, I think it should have the same place as other rights, uh, freedom of speech, um, you know, due process, all of that. But by the same token, I mean, I don't think it is, it, it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be less important than other rights, but it shouldn't be more important than other rights too. You know, if there is, so what, you know, my standard formulation is that um, I think uh, the government, just as with any other right, if it has a compelling state interest to override that right for some limited amount of time, then it, it can do that. Uh, you know, free speech rights uh, can be, they, there are time, place and manner restrictions on free speech rights. Um, there, you can't crowd a uh, fire in a crowded theater because it endangers public health, public safety. And so if there can be limits on, you know, those kinds of limits where the state meets a compelling 
interest, you know, there is a compelling state interest, all right, you know, fine, you can do that, you, you, you can curb uh, immigration as well. Um, but the compelling state interest standard also means that the state has to, uh, you know, meet something called strict scrutiny, uh, that its actions have to meet strict scrutiny. That's the legal legal terminology. And what does strict scrutiny mean? The strict scrutiny means that, A, uh, there should be, you know, some very, very vital uh, interest of the government, and B, that there should be no other way of accomplish that, accomplishing that interest but the uh, curbing of that particular right. Now, in the case of uh, this issue, I mean, I can imagine uh, pandemics uh, where, uh, you know, it, it would be appropriate to override immigration rights, right? There are two things, however. There are travel restrictions and then there is immigration. I think that you can make a case for travel restrictions in this instance. And Trump did, you know, so when Trump initially, in principle, you can make a case for travel restrictions. So when Trump says, oh, you know, I, uh, you know, I shut down travel with China because Wuhan was a big uh, vector, there is an argument. There is, a, there is on principle an argument for that. In practice, I think it was actually the travel restrictions have been completely useless. Travel because it required, you know, the government to act really fast and with full knowledge. But, uh, you know, David Beer of Cato Institute uh, actually just last, last week wrote a paper, and I have the number here somewhere. And, you know, he found out that by the time, yeah, by the time Trump actually imposed his uh, uh, restrictions with China, um, 6,000 passengers from Wuhan alone had already come to the United States. Well, I can tell you, I was one of them. I was not in Wuhan, yeah. but I traveled from China to the United States back on January 15th. I actually had a fever at the time. Um, I did not attribute it to, uh, you know, I, I didn't think I was a vector for any pandemic, mm -hmm. but uh, there were no travel restrictions in place. And as I understand it now, the uh, the, the knowledge about what was happening in Wuhan at that time was already known to the State Department and to the Chinese government, obviously. Um, if there were going to be travel restrictions, I would think that they would have already been in place at that time. Um, I, I hate to think that um, I'm the cause of, of all this. I don't think I am. And we can blame it on you. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly knowing what I know now, I wouldn't need a travel restriction. Yeah myself and um but but you're right for travel restrictions to be yeah. effective they you know, so by the time trump even you know got and you know and to be fair to him i mean he imposed this travel restriction at the end of january right he started restricting travel with china at the end of january which was you know still relatively early uh, especially given what bad information WHO was giving at that time. I mean, WHO did not declare a pandemic till several weeks later and was pretending that China had everything under control, right? I mean, it was, you know, every, you know, every bureaucracy in, you know, this pandemic has played, a, has something to answer from, you know, whether it is WHO, whether it is China, whether it is the Trump administration, whether it's the CDC, the FDA, and state governments. I mean, like every level of government has behaved or really badly. But anyway, so by the time Trump imposed his travel restrictions on China, 6,000 people had already come to this country from Wuhan. So the, you know, horse was already out of the barn. At that stage, you know, I am, I mean, it's an open question whether we would have been better off that instead of enforcing this travel ban, if we had been devoting those resources to mobilizing our domestic, you know, domestic response. So I'm not sure in practice, even though in principle, some of that might have been defensible, whether in practice it actually did, you know, more harm than good. When it comes to immigration and the pause that this president has imposed, I have no hesitation in saying that that is both wrong in principle and is also uh, going to have a deleterious effect on the economy. And that is not because I think 
that this country at any given time absolutely needs some quota of immigrants. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But what he has done is that instead of letting private employers make their own decisions about where, you know, what kind of workforce they need, where they need to hire, you have, cent you have central bureaucrats basically telling them that they can't hire people that they want to. At the same time, that the government has, through its, you know, economic stimulus package, given in Americans a huge disincentive to go back to work till at least the end of July. So even if businesses wanted to open right now, given that immigrant labor has been frozen out and domestic labor is being, you know, disincentivized to work, you know, it is going to have a huge negative impact uh, on this country. Um, so, yeah, so I think the immigration uh, pause is entirely ill-advised and the travel restrictions were too little too late. Mm. Well, I, I've been asking a lot of questions and I know that people have been listening, uh, but probably uh, they have questions of their own. So I'm going to invite people now uh, to use the Q&A icon at the right of your screen or perhaps it's at the bottom of your screen and uh, post your questions. Um, and um, let's turn to those now. I'm going, somebody has posted a question here. Let's see, it's from Bob. How do you think those foolish extremist protesters impact those pushing back in a more diplomatic manner? How does the former group hurt the latter group? Yeah, it's a really good question and, you know, and, uh, you know, they basically crowd out people who have legitimate concerns about this lockdown, like people like you and me, you know, where we think, you, you know, it, look, you know, Whitmer alienated a side that she needed with her heavy, you, you know, handed response. If she had not alienated Republicans by going, you know, her way, they would have had her back. Right, and these the, these extremists would have had had of an honor attacking her. Uh, she would have been covered, and it's the reverse on our side that because these extremists are, you know, co-opting what are legitimate protests with this nasty symbology, it is preventing you know uh, us from getting the general public to see what our concerns are. I mean, it is not a coincidence that, like I said, Whitmer's popularity is still 70%, even though this, the economy of the state is hurting badly, it remains 70% because now people are like protective of somebody who's protecting public health. And- Well, this so, reminds, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. What, what reminds me of when you were talking about Sweden and the respect they have for the experts. and. Um, I think there have been protests in Sweden, but for some reason uh, they haven't been co-opted the way these have. Uh, they've been more, uh, I think, civic, civically acceptable, I don't know. Um, but in some ways, um, this does kind of represent the difference between Sweden and the United States culturally. Yeah, right. And, uh, and so I wonder if, if culturally what works in Sweden couldn't be adapted, at least not exactly the same way here in the United States. I'm not sure how it would have to be different, but it might have to be different here. Right. Um, okay. Right. No, I mean, the, the tragedy is that, uh, you know, precisely because we are, uh, you know, so I mean, just as the government is being ham-handed, the response to her, the protests against, against her have been ham-handed and which only then serves the cause of legitimizing government action. So, I mean, so like, if, you do, if you do have a legitimate um, grievance with the policy, and there's a lot, I think, that you could criticize, uh, what is the, the way that citizens could influence the policy? Yeah, so I think initially, you know, uh, what was the group, Michigan Conservative, something or the other, that called Operation Gridlock, which was the first protest against uh, Whitmer, where basically they invited motorists who were economically hurting from all over the uh, state to come to Lansing and mount a civil resistance. And they were and they advised all the motorists to be responsible, you know, honk, 
uh, you know, jam up the streets, but be but socially distance, wear your masks, and don't endanger anybody's health. You know, don't you know, uh, don't draw, uh, don't become part of the problem, right? I mean, be responsible. I mean, which is a huge part of liberty is that you have to also take responsibility. Right. You know, you can't go around endangering yourself and other people and then say, hey, li my liberty, right? I mean, that doesn't work. So they had, I thought their response was just right. That's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of resistance you need. But, e you know, even that protest had its share of, you know, had some people waving the Confederate flag and, uh, you know, not wearing masks and, you know, walking around and in, in Lansing on the Capitol uh, steps. Uh, after that is just been a free for all. I mean, after that, you had people wearing, you know, gun toting militia, storming the Capitol building, you know, making people feel endangered. You have had, uh, you know, I mean, again, the incident I described of somebody with a pole with, uh, you know, doll, a brunette on a noose. I mean, uh, you know, that's just. <laughs> that's not going to win you friends and influence people, I'm afraid. Right, and I think it might have even, um, well, well, when when Governor Whitmer responded, well, we're, we're going to have to extend the lockdown even further because of these protests, yeah. they, uh, they, you know, they might have even made her more popular with certain voters around the, around right. the nation. Exactly, yeah, no, absolutely, I think so. so. So we have another question here. This is from Logan. He says, I can understand in the short term the need to restrict international travel and immigration to prevent spreading the virus, but do you think that this will be used to curtail immigration in the long run? Oh, absolutely. Of, I mean, it's, uh, you know, Stephen Miller has uh, already uh, made plans. I mean, this has already been reported. Uh, the immigration pause was supposed to be 60 days. But Trump said he will review it after that. And Miller is making plans to extend it. Meanwhile, you have already had four senators, uh, Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, and Grassley, Charles Gr Chuck Grassley, who's actually, a, you know, not reflexively anti-immigration, telling, uh, you know, the Trump administration to review its immigration policies at a time when millions of Americans are losing jobs. Uh, and call a permanent pause to immigration and not hand out any more guest worker visa programs. So, yes, I mean, I think it is going to have, uh, you know, a huge long term impact um, on immigration. I think and I think if this president gets uh, reelected, uh, we will see a massive curtailment of, uh, you know, immigration. Um, I think it'll be better if Biden gets elected, at least on this one count. But uh, Stephen Miller, who is uh, the president's immigration, you know, un unofficial immigration czar, he's already planning massive, massive uh, curtailment of immigration going forward. Brandon has another question. As, as many part-time service jobs do not offer health insurance, do yeah. you think the $600 from the government could be used to purchase health insurance as people return to work to offset the risk to their health? Uninsured workers might be the very concerned or might be very concerned during this time. You know, I, I mean, this is also going to be another huge issue going forward. I mean, I I, I don't see why you couldn't use your, uh, uh, you know, relief funds to purchase health care. But six hundred dollars for a few months are not going to take you very far if you're going to buy, uh, you know, health insurance from the individual market because you lost your employer coverage, right? I mean, prices on the individual market, uh, unless, uh, you know, you can get um, means tested relief is extremely high. One of my fears from this, again, uh, uh, from the standpoint of the growth of government is that given how much insurance is tied to, you know, your employment in this country, as people lose jobs, they lose their insurance too. And what you're going to see are calls for like socialized medicine. Yes. You know? I, so I think, you know, and you know, again, both sides are using this pandemic to advance their hobby horses. So the Trump administration is using it to advance its anti-immigration agenda. And I fear, you know, that uh, Democrats are going to use it to expand their calls for socialized medicine or at least single peer or, you know, something like that. So it is, it, it, 
you know, so along so, with... So you, there's some the, potential. <laughs> uh, there's some potentials for some negative things to happen. Um, I know that were implemented during the emergency and then will continue afterwards. But there may be some good things too, right? So there are some things happening right now. Everybody is uh, wondering uh, how this is going to influence the future. Are some of the things that we're doing now uh, going, to, going to be things that we're doing uh, for the foreseeable future? And, well, and what, what's your reaction to that? Well, there are, like you said, I mean, there, there are some good things that are coming out of this, right? I mean, what, from, and I mean at the policy level. Uh, hmm. So there is, uh, you know, the FDA there is under a lot of pressure to deregulate the way it does drug approvals. So simplify the clinical trials process, expedite it. There has been new scrutiny on the CDC, which is mm -hmm. the role it has played. Um, you know, the fact that it has a monopoly on testing viruses, uh, you know, uh, vaccine strains uh, for, uh, you know, in this case also sheds light on how it certifies what strains of vaccines should be produced for a general flu season. I think there is a great deal of scrutiny. There is interestingly in the left, because there are all the, you know, there is such a huge uh, problem with uh, unemployment, there is a movement even on the left to simplify occupational licensing laws at the state level so that uh, people can be more self-employed. Certificate of need laws at every state, you know, th that uh, certificate of need laws, which basically give these are local and state laws, which basically prevent healthcare facilities from being established till they have proved to state bureaucrats that there is a need for them. And that became a huge bottleneck, you know, when hospitals were trying to scale up their COVID facilities and their COVID response. So there, there is a huge rethinking of certificate of need laws going on, which is which will be really good in terms of you know bringing down healthcare costs in this country. So yeah, so if there, every dark cloud has a silver lining, and this might be <laughs> this. There may be a few. Yeah. I think especially in in healthcare and uh, in public health policy, I think there'll be some changes. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I think that with that, we are probably going to close our conversation. I I really enjoyed talking to you as usual, and uh, I, I really appreciate reading your your articles as they come out. Thank and you. uh, you're welcome. And thank you once again for participating in our Freedom Seminar. Thank you for having me. This was really a lot of fun. And I know I'm standing in the way of, uh, you know, your students and their Zoom happy hour. So. <laughs> yes, well, there's that. They do have to wait for me to give them uh, some closing remarks. Okay, but other than I'm that, you guys, I'm, not the I'm, I'm actually the gatekeeper here. So, but And for all of you who participated uh, virtually in this year's seminar, you know, it's a new format for us. I, I certainly hope that uh, it was useful to you. And, uh, you know, that speaking of things that will change, I hope that in the future, uh, when we meet face to face to give this conference, that we will also permit people from around the country to tune in live and to ask questions live. I think that that's something that uh, we'll try to continue to do here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. And, and now I want to. Uh, to, to say just a few remarks in, in closing as this Freedom Seminar has, has come to an end. So uh, I, I want to say some, some things about the Northwood idea um, as it relates to uh, the pressure that we're, we're feeling right now and the, the challenges that we're facing right now. The Northwood idea is a philosophy that emphasizes the importance of free enterprise, individual freedom and responsibility, ethical citizenship, limited government. We believe in the creative powers of the individual, their ability to adapt to changing circumstances and to solve problems. We believe that the more freedom people have to put their good ideas into practice, the better it is for everybody. And we believe that the American dream is not just a daydream, it's something achievable. And each one of us can through our own hard work, dedication, we can achieve it. 
Every successful business, every promotion at work, and every job offer that a fresh college graduate receives represents another milestone in some person's journey on their version of the American dream. So in recent weeks, the shuttered businesses, canceled commencement ceremonies, and the hiring freezes, these are limiting the American dream or at least delaying it for many people. And this has been a troubling time to graduate from college. It's been a troubling time to be a small business owner. But what I want to say about the Northwood idea is it is also essentially optimistic that this crisis, we've been told by some speakers, is not the only crisis that our society has faced. And as in past crisis, individuals exercising their special talents, living out their vocation, and investing in their American dream will be the problem solvers, will be the people that move us forward. And this is a bump in the road. It is certainly uh, not the end of the road for, for, for us. And uh, I, I want to thank you for joining us at the Freedom Seminar this year. I want to thank the McNair Center for the study of free enterprise and entrepreneurship for sponsoring this year's event. And I want to invite you uh, back again next year for the Freedom Seminar. Thank you very much.